Section One of the Mysteries of London, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume Three by George W. M. Reynolds. The Travelling Carriage. It was about nine o'clock in the evening of the 2nd of November, 1826, that a travelling carriage stopped on its way to London to change horses at the principal hotel in the little town of Staines. The inmates of the vehicle were two ladies, an elderly domestic in livery, and a female attendant occupied the box. The night was clear, fine, and frosty. The moon shone brightly and the carriage lamps threw a strong glare to a considerable distance in front of the vehicle the active ostlers speedily unharnessed the four weary steeds and substituted as many fresh ones in their place the two postboys leapt into their saddles the landlord cried all right and the carriage rolled rapidly away from the inn the horse's shoes striking fire against the stones if there be anything particularly calculated to raise the spirits said one lady to the other a few minutes after the chariot had left the peaceful town behind it is travelling upon such a beauteous night as this i am delighted to observe that you are in good spirits this evening my dear lady hatfield was the reply after passing four long months at sir ralph walsingham's country seat london will present fresh attractions for your ladyship my dear miss mordaunt returned lady hatfield in a serious tone you are aware that i am indifferent to those formal parties and ceremonial assemblies which are reckoned amongst the pleasures of the fashionable world and i can assure you that had not my uncle purported to return to london in a few days my own inclinations would have urged me to prolong my stay at walsingham manor for my part said miss mordaunt i am quite delighted with the idea of hastening back to the great metropolis a summer in the country is only tolerable because each day brings one nearer to the enjoyments of a winter in town but really my dear lady hatfield you are not reasonable rich young and beautiful as you are your own mistress and with the handsomest man in england dying to lay his coronet at your feet i shall never marry julia hastily interrupted lady hatfield pray let us change the conversation a few minutes ago i was in excellent spirits and now she paused and a deep sigh escaped her bosom did i not say that you were quite unreasonable exclaimed her companion here i am five years older than yourself but i do not mind telling you my dear friend that i shall never see thirty again and yet i have not renounced the idea of changing my condition i know that i am neither so good-looking nor so wealthy as you still i have my little ambition sir christopher blunt would deem himself honoured were i to smile graciously upon him but my brother the lieutenant who by the by expects his captaincy in a few days thanks to the interest of your kind uncle sir ralph declares that if i ever marry a mere knight he will never speak to me again lady hatfield had fallen into a profound reverie and paid not the slightest regard to the confidential outpourings of her garrulous companion miss mordaunt who laboured under the pleasing impression that lady hatfield's silence was occasioned by the deep interest which she took in the present topic continued to rattle away with her tongue as fast as the carriage did with its wheels i am sure it was a very great act of kindness in you to ask me to spend the winter with you in london for as papa is compelled to reside in ireland in consequence of the unsettled state of his tenantry i should have been under the necessity of returning to the emerald isle after my four months visit with you to walsingham manor had you not taken that compassion on me but let us speak of yourself dear lady hatfield without a soul in the world to control your actions with the means of procuring every enjoyment and with lord ellingham going mad on your account julia said lady hatfield with a start again i beseech you to drop this subject 
and as you will be my companion for some months to come let me now once for all enjoin you to abstain from such topics as you cannot read the secrets of my heart pray bear in mind the fact that many a light word uttered thoughtlessly and with no malicious intent may touch a chord that will thrill she added calmly but bitterly to the inmost recesses of my soul oh my dear lady hatfield exclaimed miss mordaunt who in spite of her loquacity was a very good-natured person i am rejoiced that you have given me this warning and how foolish of me not to have observed what indeed i now remember that the topic of love never was agreeable to you to be sure it was during the sermon upon the felicity of the wedded state that you fainted and were taken into the vestry lady hatfield writhed in mental agony and bitterly at that moment did she repent the invitation which she had given her thoughtless companion to pass the winter with her in london the carriage had now reached the little town of bedford which it traversed without stopping and continued its rapid way towards hounslow but all of a sudden the course of the chariot was checked as if by an unexpected impediment in the way and the horses began to plunge frightfully at the same time the lady's maid on the box uttered a dreadful scream lady hatfield drew down the window nearest to her the chaise that moment came to a full stop and a stern but evidently disguised voice exclaimed keep your horses quiet you damned fools and don't mind me if you stir till i give you leave i'll blow out the brains of both of you robbers shrieked miss mordaunt in a despairing tone oh what will become of us lady hatfield looked from the window and at the same instant a man mounted on horseback with a black mask over his countenance and a pistol in each hand was by the side of the vehicle villain cried the livery servant on the box but you shall swing for this perhaps i may said the highwayman coolly though still speaking in a feigned tone as is the custom with individuals of his profession upon such occasions as the one we are describing and if you attempt to move old fellow from where you are an ounce of lead shall tumble you down from your perch beg pardon ma'am continued the robber turning towards lady hatfield who had shrunk back into the corner of the carriage the moment the desperado appeared at the window sorry to inconvenience you but your purse lady hatfield handed the highwayman her reticule good said he perceiving by its weight and a certain jingling sound which it sent forth that it contained gold but you have a companion ma'am her purse miss mordaunt complied with this demand and implored the good gentleman not to murder her the highwayman gave no reply but vouchsafed a most satisfactory proof of his intended forbearance in that respect by putting spurs to his steed and darting off like an arrow in the direction of hounslow cowardly villains that you are ejaculated the livery servant hurling this reproach against the postboys and what are you old fool cried the postillion who rode the wheel-horse but he'll be nabbed yet drive on drive on exclaimed lady hatfield from the window we are all frightened and not hurt indeed my dear said miss mordaunt as the carriage started off rapidly once more i am seriously hurt grievously wounded you julia cried her ladyship in unfeigned surprise yes in pocket was the answer implying deep vexation all the remainder of my quarter's allowance oh compose yourself on that head interrupted lady hatfield you shall not be compelled to acquaint mr mordaunt with your loss this assurance conveying a promise of pecuniary assistance materially tended to tranquillize the mind of miss mordaunt but the event which had just occurred apart from the mere robbery of her reticule awoke the most painful reflections in the mind of lady hatfield by the by said miss mordaunt after a short pause for she never remained long silent this audacious outrage reminds me of something your uncle sir ralph walsingham was telling me one day when you interrupted him in the middle i think he informed me that about six or seven years ago when you were only eighteen or nineteen 
you were staying at your dear lamented father's country house where you were quite alone for of course one does not call the servants anybody when the mansion was broken into by robbers during the night julia exclaimed lady hatfield her whole frame fearfully convulsed by the powerful though useless efforts which she made to subdue her agitation never i implore you again allude to that dreadful event well i never will said miss mordaunt and yet if one must not speak of love nor yet of marriage nor yet of midnight burglaries nay i was wrong to cut you short thus abruptly remarked lady hatfield now endeavouring to rob her prayer of the importance with which her solemn earnestness of manner had invested it only do choose some more enlivening topic after the fright which we have just experienced the first thing to-morrow morning said miss mordaunt who had not noticed the full extent of the impression which her allusion to the burglaries of some years back had made upon her companion for julia was too flippant superficial and volatile to pay much attention to the emotions of others the first thing to-morrow morning we must give information to the bow street runners concerning this highway robbery secondly we must write to the landlord at staines to tell him what a couple of cowardly fellows he has got in the shape of these postilions and thirdly you must discharge old mason who is evidently incapable of protecting his mistress much less her friends discharge old mason exclaimed lady hatfield impossible how could he have protected us he is unarmed whereas the highwaymen flourish two large pistols doubtless loaded but here we are safe at hounslow the carriage drew up at the door of the hotel in this town and the postilions immediately narrated the particulars of the robbery to the landlord and his attendant tribe of hangers-on well this is fortunate cried the landlord when the tale was told quite a godsend as one may say as how please sir exclaimed the elder postboy astonished at the remark why it happens that dykes the famous bow street officer is in the hotel at this very instant said the landlord john he added turning to a waiter who stood near beg mr dykes to step this way and what's dykes doing down here asked the postboy when the waiter had disappeared to execute the commission he had received he's been investigating a century fire replied an ostler for the landlord disdaining to hold any farther converse with a postillion had stepped up to the window to inquire whether the ladies chose to alight having received a negative answer accompanied with an intimation that the sooner the carriage was allowed to proceed the more agreeable it would be to lady hatfield and miss mordaunt the landlord returned towards the spot where the postilions the hangers-on of the hotel and other loungers were grouped together mr dykes almost immediately afterwards made his appearance in the form of a tall stout heavy but powerfully built man shabby genteel in his attire and carrying a strong ash-stick in his hand the particulars of the highway robbery were described to him in a very few moments how was the fellow dressed asked the officer a black coat said the first postboy no it wasn't cried the second then what was it demanded mr dykes i don't know but i'm sure it wasn't a black un was the highly satisfactory answer describe the horse said dykes impatiently brown switch tail standing about fourteen hands nonsense ejaculated the second postilion interrupting his companion who had volunteered the explanation it was a light bay the moon fell full upon it so did the carriage lights come i see we are only losing time cried the officer which way did he go he galloped off in this direction was the reply which remained uncontradicted then he'll be in london to-night whichever road he took said mr dykes if your ladies will give me a cast as far as town i'll be after the villain perhaps he turned off to the left towards hatton and so over by hanwell and then shepherd's bush or else he made straight for richmond and so over into surrey but one way or another he's sure to be in london by midnight and ten to one if i don't pounce on him 
"'My business is done down here, "'and I may just as well toddle back tonight as tomorrow morning.' "'The substance of these remarks was communicated to Lady Hatfield, "'who could not well do otherwise than accord a seat on the box to Mr. Dykes, "'Charlotte the lady's maid removing to the interior of the carriage. "'These arrangements having been effected, the vehicle pursued its way, and shortly after eleven o'clock it drew up at the door of a mansion on Piccadilly Hill. Mr. Dykes, having asked the ladies a few questions, promised to communicate the result of his efforts to capture the highwaymen, and then took his departure. Lady Hatfield and Miss Morden shortly retired to their respective bedchambers, the latter to dream of the delights of London, the former to moisten her pillow with tears, for the recent adventure had awakened in her mind feelings of the most agonizing description. End of section one. Section two of the Mysteries of London, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit. LibriVox.org Recording by Gray Clayton The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds, Section 2 Tom Rain and Old Death It was about half-past eight on the following morning when the two individuals entered a public house in White Hart Street, Drury Lane. One was a man of about thirty years of age, with florid complexion, light hair, and red whiskers, yet possessing a countenance which, viewed as a whole, was very far from disagreeable. His eyes were of a deep blue, and indicated not only good humour, but a certain generosity of disposition, which was not impaired by an association with many less amiable qualities, such as a wild recklessness of character, an undaunted bravery, a love of perilous adventure, and a sad deficiency of principle on particular points, the nature of which will hereafter transpire. He was evidently proud of a very fine set of teeth, the brilliancy of which compensated for the somewhat coarse thickness of his lips, and the delicate whiteness of his hands showed that he did not earn his livelihood by any arduous labour. In person he was about the middle height, by no means inclined to corpulency, and yet possessing a well-knit frame with a muscular power indicative of great physical strength. His dress partook of the half-sporting, half-rakish character, consisting of a high chimney-pot kind of hat with very narrow brims, a checked blue silk neckerchief, fine linen, a buff waistcoat, cutaway Newmarket style of green coat, drab breeches and top boots. The proper name of this flash gentleman was Thomas Rainford, but his friends having taken the liberty of docking each word of a syllable, he was invariably known as Tom Rain. The other individual was an old man of at least sixty with white hair, but eyes of a fire glaring from beneath a pair of thick shaggy grey brows. He was upwards of six feet in height, and but little bowed by the weight of years which he bore. Having lost all his teeth, his mouth had fallen in so as to form a complete angle, the depth of which was rendered the more remarkable by the extreme prominence of his hooked nose and his projecting chin. He was as thin as it was possible to be without having the bones actually protruding through his skin, which hung about them like a tanned leather casing. He was dressed in a long, grey, surtout coat, reaching below his knees, a pair of shabby black trousers, very short, and black cloth gaiters, fitting loosely over that description of shoes generally denominated high lows. On his head he wore a greasy cap with a large front. His linen was by no means of the cleanest, and his appearance altogether was excessively unprepossessing, if not absolutely revolting. What his real name was, very few of even his most intimate acquaintances were aware, for his dreadful emaciation of form had procured for him the frightful pseudonym of Old Death. 
Tom Rain and his hideous companion entered the public house in White Hart Street, nodded familiarly to the landlord as they passed by the bar, and ascended the stairs to a private room on the first floor. Having seated themselves at the table, Tom Rain began the conversation. Well, have you considered my proposal? he asked. I have, replied the old man in a deep sepulchral tone. But I am cautious, very cautious, my good friend. "'So you told me when I saw you three days ago for the first time,' observed Rain impatiently. "'But Tullock, the landlord of this place, is a pal of yours, and he knows me well, too. Hasn't he satisfied you about me?' "'Well, well, I can't say that he hasn't,' answered Old Death. "'Still, a cautious man like me never says yes in a hurry. "'Tullock knew you eight or nine years ago down in the country, "'and there's no doubt that you was a right sort of blade.' "'And so I am now,' cried Tom Rain, striking the table angrily with his clenched fist. "'Softly, softly, my good friend,' said Old Death. "'We shall agree better afterwards if we have a good understanding at first. "'I was going to observe that for some years Tullock loses sight of you. "'He comes up to town, takes this public, and doesn't even remember "'that there's such a fellow in existence as yourself "'until you make your appearance here a few days back.' "'When he received me with open arms and introduced me to you,' added Tom Rain. "'But go on. What's next?' "'Ah, what next?' replied Old Death, with a horrible chuckle that issued from his throat as if it came from the depths of a tomb. "'Why, you, frankly and candidly, told me your intentions and views. "'I admit that you can't do without me. "'You can't do without me, my dear boy, and you know it.' Again the hideous old man chuckled in his cavern-like tones. "'I never denied what you say,' answered Tom Rain. "'On the contrary, I am well aware that no one in my line can think of doing business about London and making London his headquarters without your assistance.' "'To be sure not,' said the old man, evidently pleased with this compliment. "'I've had the monopoly of it all for this thirty years, and never once got into trouble. But then—' I do my business with caution, such caution. I've dealings with all that are worth having dealings with, and not one of them knows even where I live. Only let me find a sure and ready money market for my goods, exclaimed Tom Rain, and I'll do more business with you than all the chaps you speak of put together. Well, I suppose we must come to terms, said Old Death after a short pause. Tullock assures me that you were straightforward when he knew you in the country, and though time changes men's minds as well as their faces, I'll take it for granted that you're all right. You remember the conditions? Not a word you uttered three days ago has escaped my memory, answered Rain. Good. When shall you commence business? I opened my shop last night, replied Tom with a hearty laugh. "'Nonsense!' replied the old man, fixing a glance of delight upon his new friends. "'You don't mean to say that. In a word, is this yours?' As he spoke, old Death drew from his pocket the morning's newspaper, pointed to a particular advertisement, and held the journal towards his companion. Tom Rain's countenance was overclouded for a moment, but almost immediately afterwards it expanded into an expression of mingled surprise and satisfaction. And snapping his fingers joyfully, he explained, Is it possible? Could it have been her? Oh, this business is speedily settled. And rising from his seat, he rang the bell violently. A potboy answered his summons. Pen, ink and paper, and a messenger to carry a letter said Tom Rain, with extraordinary rapidity of utterance. The boy disappeared, and old Death, recovering partially from the astonishment into which his companion's ejaculations and manner on reading the advertisement had thrown him, exclaimed, What the devil are you after now? You shall see in a moment, was the reply. But I don't promise you any explanation of what you will see, he added with another hearty laugh. The boy returned, bringing writing materials, and intimating that he was willing to be the bearer of the letter. Tom Rain told him to wait. Then, having hastily written a few lines upon a sheet of paper, he tossed the note over to Old Death, who read as follows. 
remember the night of the 27th of October, 1819, and stop the inquiries institute in respect of the little business referred to by the advertisement in this morning's times. This is past all comprehension, explained the old man, still keeping his eyes fixed upon the paper. The note has not even a signature. It does not require one, coolly observed Tom Rain, as he snatched the letter from his companion and proceeded to fold it up. And do you hope to crush the business by means of that scrap of writing? asked Old Death, evidently perplexed what to think. I don't merely hope. I am certain of accomplishing my object, was the reply. Now, mind you, ain't deceiving yourself, Tom, said Old Death. The man who has taken up the affair is persevering as a beaver and crafty as a fox. You may see that he is in earnest by the expedition he must have made to get the advertisement into this morning's paper. I should have hardly thought it possible to be done. However, done it is, and though it gives no description of the person, yet it offers a good reward for his apprehension. No one knows what trivial circumstance may afford a trace, and— "'Enough of this, old friend,' cried Tom, and handing the letter, now duly folded, wafered, and directed, to the boy, he said, "'Take this to the address written upon it, see if there's any answer, and I shall wait here till you come back. Look alive, and you'll earn a crown for the job.' The boy hastened away to execute the commission which he had received. "'And so that was your business, Master Tom,' observed Old Death, as soon as the messenger had disappeared. Well, you've made a good beginning. It promises bright things. What, do you fancy that I haven't had plenty of experience down in the country? cried Rainford. Ah, oh, I could tell you a tale or two. But no matter now. And the little business, Tom, inquired the old man, did it turn out worth the trouble? The advertisement says, Hark ye, Master Death, exclaimed Rainford firmly, that business does not regard you. Our compact dates from this morning. Ah, very good, very good, interrupted Old Death in a surly tone. Be it as you say, but remember, if you do get into any trouble on account of this, you mustn't expect me to help you out of it. Neither do I, answered Tom. However, I am a generous chap in my way, and I don't mind yielding to you in this instance, for you must suppose that I can see your drift plain enough. The advertisement says a purse containing a banknote for fifty pounds and eleven sovereigns, and a reticule containing a purse in which there were three ten-pound notes and sixteen sovereigns. This is accurate enough. The reticule I flung away, the two purses I kept, and here they are. Thus speaking, Tom Rainford threw upon the table the objects last mentioned. Old Death's eyes glared with a kind of savage joy as they caught a glimpse of the yellow metal and the flimsy paper through the network of the purses. "'Pretty things, pretty things,' he muttered between his toothless gums. "'I think you'll do well, Tom. "'And I am sure I shall. "'But turn the money out on the table. "'You care more about the handling of it than I do.' Old Death grinned horribly a ghastly smile and lost no time in obeying the hint conveyed. Twenty-seven golden boys, and eighty pounds in bank notes, said the hideous man. The gold is yours, that's part of our conditions. Half the value of the bank notes is mine for the risk and trouble in cashing them, and that's also part and parcel of our conditions. So I give you forty sovereigns, forty golden sovereigns. Tom, we shall be square. Just so carelessly observed Rain. Old Death produced a greasy leather bag from a pocket in the breast of his grey coat, and counted thence the forty sovereigns on which he had laid such emphasis. Tom Rain thrust the coin into his breeches pocket without reckoning it, while his companion first secured the banknotes in the greasy bag, and then threw the two purses into the fire. "'You're a good fellow, Tom,' "'A generous-hearted fellow. "'And I'm much pleased with you,' said the old man. "'I shall leave you now, "'as I have some little trifling matters "'to attend to in another part of the town. "'When you want me, "'you know where to leave a message.' 
all right ejaculated tom rainford who did not appear over anxious to detain his new friend they accordingly separated old death taking his departure and the other remaining behind to await the return of the messenger it is necessary to state that when old death quitted the public house he was joined a few paces up the street by a sharp-looking ill-clad youth of about fifteen whose pale countenance bright eyes and restless glances denoted mental activity struggling against bad health approaching the old man the youth walked by his side without uttering a symbol jacob said death after a brief pause and sinking his voice to a whisper you saw that swell-looking chap who went into tullock's with me just now well i told you to be here this morning at a particular hour on purpose that you might see him he will be useful to me very useful but i must know more of him and he is not the man to be pumped do you wait here and watch him dog him about find out where he goes where he lives whether he has a mistress or a wife or neither or both added jacob with a low chuckle yes anything that concerns him in fine continued old death i am going to toby bunce's on the dials where i shall be for the next three or four hours if i am wanted very good i understand said jacob and retracing his steps he hid himself in a court which commanded a view of tullock's public house let us now return to tom rain who was waiting for the reappearance of his messenger it was shortly before ten when the pot-boy once more stood in his presence well said rainford interrogatively i see the lady herself was the reply and i give her the note i thought it was something particular so i told the flunkey i'd only deliver it into her hands and how did she receive it asked tom i was shown into a parlour and told to wait in a few moments the door opened and in come a lady such a splendid creature i never seed such a fine woman in my life before our bar gals nothing to her so i give her the note she looked at the writing on the outside but didn't seem to know it and then she opened the letter and my eye didn't she give a start i thought she'd have fell slap on her face for a minute or so she couldn't recover herself at last she says tell the writer of this note that it shall be attended to and she put half a crown into my hands that's all i knew it would be so cried tom rain in a triumphant tone here's the five shillings i promised you my boy and i don't think you've made a bad morning's work of it the lad grinned a smile of satisfaction and withdrew rainford soon after descended to the bar conversed for a few minutes with his friend tullock the landlord and then took his departure duly watched by jacob he had reached the corner of drury lane when he felt himself somewhat rudely tapped on the shoulder turning hastily round he was confronted by a tall stout man who without any ceremonial preface exclaimed you're wanted my good fellow i know i am replied tom coolly as he measured the stranger from head to foot with a calm but searching glance and i'm now on my way to the place where my presence is required just so said the stout man because you are going to favour me with your company that i may introduce you to a party who wishes to become better acquainted with you who's the friend you speak of asked tom in an easy off-hand kind of manner sir walter ferguson was the reply so come along with these words the stout man took rainford's arm and led him away to the police court in bow street jacob who was an unsuspected witness of the whole proceeding immediately took the shortest way to seven dials end of section two recording by gray clayton section three of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Bow Street. 
the moment mr dykes had lodged his prisoner in one of the cells attached to the court he hurried off to piccadilly hill and knocked loudly at the door of lady hatfield's residence upon explaining the nature of his business to the domestic who answered the summons he was admitted into an apartment where lady hatfield and miss mordaunt almost immediately joined him lady hatfield was the orphan daughter of the earl and countess of morleverer she was an only child the proud title of morleverer had become extinct with the demise of her father but the family property had devolved to her she was in her twenty-fifth year and surpassingly beautiful the style of her loveliness was fascinating and intellectual rendered the more interesting too by the tinge of melancholy which characterized her countenance her eyes were large and of a deep blue the soul sate enthroned on her pale and lofty forehead her smile though always plaintively mournful denoted amiability and kindness in stature she was of the middle height and though in the least degree inclining to en bon point yet the fulness of her form marred not its lightness nor its grace the bust was rounded in voluptuous luxuriance and the hips were expanded but the waist was naturally small the limbs tapered gradually downwards and her step was so elastic while her gait was easy though dignified that even the most critical judge of female attractions could not have found it in his heart to cavil at her symmetry miss mordaunt was a lady who had seen thirty-five summers although she would have gone into hysterics had any one suggested that such was really the fact she was short thin and not particularly good-looking for her hair was of so decided a red that it would have been a mockery instead of a compliment to term it auburn her eyes were grey and her nose suspiciously inclining to the species called pulk but her complexion was good her teeth well preserved and white and her hand very beautifully formed thus when she looked in her glass which was as often as she passed near it she mentally summed up the good and the bad points of her personal appearance invariably striking a balance in favour of the first and thence arriving at the very logical conclusion that she should yet succeed in escaping from a condition of single blessedness it was a little after eleven o'clock when lady hatfield and miss mordaunt were informed that mr dykes requested an immediate interview with them some event of that morning's occurrence had already produced a strange and almost alarming effect upon georgiana such was lady hatfield's christian name and in order to regain her spirits to recover indeed from a sudden shock which she had received her ladyship had proposed an early airing in the carriage to this julia who had some shopping to do readily assented they had accordingly just completed their toilette for this purpose and were now waiting in the drawing-room for the arrival of the chariot when the announcement of mr dykes's name called such an ejaculation of anguish from lady hatfield's lips that miss mordaunt was seriously alarmed but georgiana the expression of whose countenance indicated for an instant the agony of a heart wounded to its very core subdued her emotions by a violent effort and then in answer to her friend's solicitous inquiries attributed the temporary agitation she had experienced to a sudden pain passing through her head it was nevertheless with feelings of mingled terror and repugnance that georgiana accompanied julia to the room where the bow street officer awaited them her very eyelids quivered with suspense when she found herself in the presence of the celebrated thief-taker well ladies exclaimed mr dykes rising from a chair and making an awkward bow as they entered i've good news for you the highwayman is is repeated georgiana with nervous impatience is in custody my lady and now all i want who is in custody demanded georgiana hope for a moment wildly animating her the man that robbed you last night my lady answered the officer or else i'm damp beg pardon very much mistaken but how do you know he is the same exclaimed lady hatfield perhaps you may have erred your suspicions may have misled you ah my lady interrupted dykes totally mistaking the cause of georgiana's warmth 
"'You surely ain't going to plead in favour of a chap that stopped you on the king's highway, "'and did then and there steal from your person and from the person of your friend?' "'Describe the individual whom you have arrested,' said Lady Hatfield abruptly. "'To a nicety I will,' answered the officer, who was now completely in his element. "'About thirty years of age, good complexion, light curly hair, red whiskers, dark blue eyes, splendid teeth, thick lips. "'But here's your carriage come round to the door, my lady, and nothing could possibly be more convenient. "'Please not to waste time, as I think we can get him committed to-day. The moment Dykes had begun his description, Lady Georgiana's eyes expressed the agonising nature of the suspense which she had endured. But as he continued, and his portraiture became the more definite, an ashy paleness overspread her countenance. This agitation on her part was not, however, perceived by either the Bow Street officer or Miss Mordaunt, for the former had a habit of fixing his eyes on the knob of his ash stick, when he was engrossed in a professional topic, and the latter was drinking in with greedy ears the description of the supposed highwayman, whom she was quite astonished to hear represented as so very discrepant from her idea of what a midnight desperado must be. The arrival of the carriage was, under the circumstances, quite a relief to Georgiana, and, without uttering another objection, she allowed Mr. Dykes to have his own way in the matter. That experienced officer rang the bell as coolly as if the house was his own, and desired that the man-servant and lady's maid who were in attendance on their mistress the preceding night would prepare to accompany him to Bow Street. Mason and Charlotte speedily obeyed this request, and the chariot, instead of taking the ladies up Bond Street, conveyed them, the two servants, and Mr. Dykes to the police office. On their arrival, Mr. Dykes conducted his witnesses into a private room, and, after an absence of about five minutes, returned with the intelligence that the night charges were just disposed of, and that the prisoner was about to be placed in the dock. A shudder passed through Georgiana's frame, but with a desperate effort to compose herself, she followed Mr. Dykes into the court, Miss Mordaunt and the two servants remaining in the private room until they should be summoned individually to give their testimony. As Georgiana was a lady of rank and fortune, she was not treated as a humble witness would have been, but was accommodated with a chair, Mr. Dykes assuring her, in a confidential whisper, that she need not stand up to give her evidence. The body of the court was crowded with a motley assembly of spectators. The news that a highwayman was about to be examined having spread like wildfire through the neighbourhood. Scarcely was Georgiana seated when a sensation on the part of the crowd enabled her to judge that the accused was being brought in, and as Tom Rain leapt nimbly into the dock, she cast a rapid glance towards him, a glance in which terror was combined with indescribable disgust and aversion. The accused affected not to notice her, but lounged in a very easy and familiar fashion over the front of the dock surveying first sir walter ferguson and then the clerk with a complacency which would have almost induced an uninitiated stranger to imagine that they were the prisoners and he was the magistrate mr dykes being called upon by sir walter to explain the nature of the charges against the prisoner declared that in consequence of information which he had received the invariable phraseology of old police officers he had arrested the accused on suspicion of having stopped Lady Hatfield's carriage on the preceding evening, and robbed her ladyship and her ladyship's friend of certain monies specified in an advertisement which he had caused to be inserted in that morning's paper. Mr. Dykes further stated that, having searched the prisoner, he had found upon him a considerable sum in gold, but none of the banknotes stolen. Lady Hatfield was then sworn and she corroborated the officer's statement relative to the robbery. "'Has your ladyship any reason to suppose that the prisoner in the dock is the person by whom your carriage was stopped?' inquired the magistrate. "'I feel well convinced, sir,' was the reply, delivered, however, in a tremulous tone, "'that the prisoner at the bar is not the man by whom I was robbed.' A smile of triumph curled the lips of Tom Rain but Mr. Dykes surveyed Georgiana with stupid astonishment. 
not the man my lady he ejaculated at length why last night your ladyship could give no description of what the robber was or what he was not dykes hold your tongue cried the magistrate her ladyship is upon her oath your worship said georgiana in a firmer voice than before i was so bewildered last evening so overcome with terror naturally so lady hatfield observed the magistrate with a very courteous smile which seemed to say that he would rather believe the bare word of a member of the aristocracy especially a lady than the oaths of all his officers and runners out together in fact continued sir walter blandly you were too much flurried to use a common expression to reply calmly and deliberately to any questions which dykes may have put to you last evening such was indeed the case your worship answered georgiana this morning however i have been enabled to collect my ideas and to recall to mind the smallest details of the robbery the highwayman had a black mask upon his face but by a sudden movement of his horse as he stood by the carriage window the mask slipped aside and i caught a glimpse of his countenance by the moonlight and that countenance said the magistrate was quite different from the prisoner's replied lady hatfield firmly your ladyship did not make that statement when i gave you the description of the prisoner just now said dykes evidently bewildered by the nature of georgiana's testimony because you hurried me away together with my friend and two of my servants in a manner so precipitate that i had no time to utter a word returned lady hatfield moreover as you had taken the prisoner into custody i believed it to be necessary that his case should be brought beneath the cognizance of his worship georgiana spoke in a tone apparently so decided and calm that the officer knew not how to reply although in his heart he suspected her sincerity the magistrate consulted the clerk and after the interchange of a few whispers sir walter said i see no reason for detaining the prisoner there is evidently some mistake on your part dykes your worship exclaimed the officer i know not what to think can the prisoner give a good account of himself he rides into london from richmond at six o'clock this morning puts his horse up at an inn in the borough goes to a coffee-house in another street to have his breakfast and leaves a pair of pistols for the waiter to take care of for him then walks over to a suspicious public not a hundred miles from this court meets there a man that me and my partners have long had our eyes on and when he is searched has a large sum in gold about his person do you hear what the officer says prisoner inquired the magistrate i do your worship answered tom rain coolly and i can explain it all i come up to london on business which requires the sum of money found upon me i put up my horse where i think fit and i go elsewhere to get my breakfast because i can have it cheaper than at the inn i was armed with pistols because i had to travel a lonely road in the dark and i left them at the coffee-house because i did not choose to drag them about with me all day long mr dykes was about to reply when two decently dressed men who had entered the court a few minutes previously stepped forward please your worship said the first i have known mr rainford the last four years and a more respectable man does not exist he came up to london to buy a couple of horses of me and he was to pay ready money my name's watkins your worship and i've kept livery and bait stables in great queen street lincoln's inn fields for the last seventeen years and i your worship said the other person in his turn can answer for mr rainford if you doubt my respectability your worship send one of your officers round to compton street and see if the name of bertinshaw isn't painted up in precious large letters over the best jewellery shop and pawnbrokers interrupted mr dykes significantly well and pawnbrokers too added bertinshaw i'm not ashamed of the calling then you are both prepared to guarantee the prisoner's appearance at any future time said the magistrate certainly your worship was the joint reply to answer any charges that may be brought against him continued sir walter the response was again in the affirmative on the part of watkins and bertinshaw the magistrate stated the amount of the recognizances which were to be entered into and tom rain was desired to stand down from the dock this intimation he obeyed with the same air of calm indifference 
which had characterized him throughout the proceedings and which had only been for a moment disturbed by the profound astonishment he had experienced when two men whom he had never before seen nor even heard of in his life stepped forward to give him so excellent a character and become his bail but a moment's reflection convinced him that old death was the unseen friend who worked the machinery of this manoeuvre while the clerk was filling up the bail bond lady georgiana retired from the office her bosom a prey to feeling of a strangely conflicting nature joy at having passed through an ordeal which she had dreaded grief at having stained her soul with a fell crime of deliberate perjury and agony at the sad reminiscences which the presence of rainford had recalled so forcibly to her mind miss mordaunt and the two servants were astonished to hear the unexpected turn which the proceedings had taken but their attention was almost immediately absorbed in the condition of lady hatfield who scarcely had time to communicate to them the result of her examination in the court when a sudden faintness came over her she had exhausted all her energies in the endeavour to maintain an air of calmness and to reply in a tone of sincerity when in the presence of the magistrate and now a reaction took place her courage gave way the weight of fearful reminiscences overpowered her the glow of excitement which had mantled her cheeks changed to a death-like pallor and she fainted in the arms of her friend fortunately miss mordaunt had a bottle of volatile salts with her and by these means georgiana was speedily recovered she was then led to her carriage but she did not appear to breathe freely until the vehicle was some distance from the police court End of section three Section four of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume three by George W. M. Reynolds. Section four. Chapter four. Esther de Medina let us now return to the interior of the police office the clerk was drawing up the bail bond the two securities were conversing in whispers with tom rain whom they had affected to greet when he descended from the dock as an old acquaintance and mr dykes was leaning gloomily against the partition which separated the magistrate's desk from the body of the court when the entrance of two persons produced a new sensation amongst the crowd one was an officer of the court the other was a lady closely veiled and enveloped in a cloak of rich material her form was tall and even though her entire frame was now convulsed with intense anguish as she passed amidst the gaping throng to the chair which lady hatfield had occupied two or three minutes previously yet that excess of grief and terror did not bow her down nor impair the graceful dignity of her gait the officer motioned her to seat herself an intimation which she evidently accepted with gratitude what is it bingham inquired the magistrate of the officer please your worship was the reply it's a serious charge and the prosecutor will be here in a moment very well said the magistrate i will take it directly who is she whispered dykes accosting his brother officer her name is esther de medina she tells me returned bingham the question and answer were overheard by tom rainford who was standing close by the officers and the announcement of the lady's name produced a strange and almost electrical effect upon him the devil me care recklessness of his manner suddenly disappeared and a sentiment of profound commiseration and deep interest in respect to esther de medina seemed to occupy his mind he was about to question mr bingham relative to the charge which he had against her when the clerk called upon him and his securities to sign the bond this ceremony was speedily performed and rain's money was returned to him by mr dykes who however looked at him in a manner which seemed to say i know i'm not mistaken in you although you have contrived to get off but i'll have you another time 
Tom cared nothing for the sinister looks of the Bow Street officer, neither did he pay much attention to the gold which he now poured back into his pocket, for all his thoughts appeared to be absorbed in the presence of the veiled lady. "'Come along with us,' whispered Bertinshaw, "'and we will celebrate your escape over a bottle of wine at my place.' "'No, not now,' replied Tom hastily. "'I mean to stay and hear this case. It interests me.' "'Will you join us presently?' asked his new friend, who had just now pretended to be a very old one. "'Yes, yes,' answered Tom, "'in an hour or so.' Bertinshaw and Watkins took their departure. "'Now, Bingham,' cried the clerk, "'what is it?' At that moment a gentleman of handsome appearance and middle age entered the court. "'Here's the prosecutor who will explain the matter,' said the officer. The prisoner, suddenly remembering the respect due to the bench, raised her veil, and at the same time she glanced in an eager, inquiring manner towards the individual who now appeared against her. But we must pause to describe her. She was not more than eighteen years of age, and surpassingly lovely. Her complexion was a clear, transparent olive, beneath which the delicate tinge of carnation was not entirely chased away from her cheeks by the terror and grief that now oppressed her. Her face was of the aquiline cast, her forehead broad, high, and intelligent, her nose curved but not too prominent in shape, her mouth small, with thin vermilion lips, revealing teeth of pearly whiteness, her chin sweetly rounded, and her eyes large, black, and brilliant and never did more splendid orbs of light mirror the whole power of the soul or flash brighter glances from beneath richly fringed lids and then her brows were so delicately pencilled and so finely arched that they gave an air of dignity to that lovely that fascinating countenance her hair too was of the deepest black a black so intense that the raven's wing might not have compared with it silken and glossy the luxuriant mass was parted above the forehead, and flowing in two shining bands, one on each side of the face, for which they appeared to form an ebony frame, was gathered behind the ears. In stature she was tall, sylph-like, and graceful. Her shoulders had that fine slope which the Italian masters so much admired, and with which they were delighted to endow the heroines of their pictures. Her waist was admirably proportioned, and not rendered too thin by the unnatural art of tight lacing. Her hand was of exceeding beauty. Her feet and ankles were in perfect keeping with the exquisite symmetry of her form, and her gestures were full of dignity and grace. She was a Jewess, and if the most glorious beauty were honoured with a diadem, then should Esther de Medina have become queen of the scattered race. The moment she raised her veil, all who could catch a glimpse of her countenance were struck with astonishment at the dazzling loveliness thus revealed, and even the magistrate felt anxious to learn what misadventure could have placed so peerless a being within the gasp of justice. Her crime could scarcely be robbery, for she was well dressed and had the appearance of belonging to even a wealthy family. Besides, her face, her eyes, seemed to denote a conscious purity of soul, in spite of the painful emotions which her present situation has excited within her bosom. But the person who was most interested, most astonished by the sudden revelation of that exquisite countenance, was Tom Rain. It was not with lustful desire that he surveyed her. It was not with any unholy passion. On the contrary, it was with a sentiment of deep devotion and profound sympathy. He also manifested extreme curiosity to learn upon what possible charge Esther de Medina could have been brought thither. On her part, she was evidently altogether unacquainted with the person of Tom Rain, but as she cast a rapid and timid glance around, her eyes lingered not upon him. The middle-aged, handsome-looking man who had just entered the office was now desired to state the grounds upon which Esther de Medina was in custody. The witness deposed that his name was Edward Gordon, and that he was a diamond merchant, residing in Arundel Street, Strand. On the 31st of October, at about five o'clock in the evening, 
a female called upon him and requested him to purchase of her a diamond ring which she produced he examined it by the light of the lamp burning in the apartment where he received her and finding that it was really a jewel of some value he offered her a price which he considered fair that sum was thirty guineas she endeavoured to obtain more but he did not consider himself justified in acceding to her wish finally she accepted his proposal received the amount left the ring and departed he went out immediately after carefully locking the door of the room having an engagement to dine with a friend he returned home late and did not enter that particular room until the following morning when he discovered that a set of diamonds which he remembered to have been lying in an open case upon the table at the time the female called on the preceding evening was missing he searched vainly in all parts of the room and at length came to the fixed conclusion that the female in question had stolen the diamonds he gave immediate information to bingham the officer together with an accurate description of the suspected person for she was upwards of twenty minutes with him on the evening of the thirty-first and he had therefore seen enough of her to know her again moreover added the prosecutor two clear days only have elapsed since the interview which took place between us and i appeal to your worship whether the countenance of the prisoner when once seen can be readily forgotten for painful as it is to accuse so young and interesting a person of such a crime my duty to society compels me to take this step and i have no hesitation in declaring that the prisoner is the female who sold me the ring a profound sigh escaped from the bosom of esther but she uttered not a word bingham the officer then proved that he called about half an hour previously upon mr gordon to inform him that he had vainly endeavoured to discover a clue to the supposed thief mr gordon was on the point of going out upon particular business and the officer in order not to detain him walked a part of the way in his company so that they might converse upon the subject of the robbery as they went along they were passing through lincoln's inn fields when they met the prisoner at the bar mr gordon instantly recognized her and the officer took her into custody she manifested much indignation and said there must be some mistake but when the nature of the charge was stated to her she turned deadly pale and burst into tears rainford had listened to these statements with the deepest the most intense interest and his countenance underwent various changes especially while mr gordon was giving his evidence at one moment tom exhibited surprise then indignation and lastly the most unfeigned sorrow but suddenly an idea seemed to strike him for a minute did he reflect profoundly and then joy animated his features hastily quitting the court he hurried to the coffee-house opposite called for writing materials and penned the following letter november the third eighteen twenty six my lord esther de medina is at bow street accused of a crime which is alleged to have been committed at about five o'clock on the evening of the thirty-first of october it is for you to prove her innocence delay not then an instant an unknown friend to esther throwing a shilling upon the table tom rain hurried away took a hackney coach to the nearest station and desired to be driven to the mansion of lord ellingham pall mall west a half guinea which he slipped into the coachman's hand as he entered the vehicle produced the desired effect for the horses were urged into a pace the rapidity of which seemed to astonish themselves as a proof of what they could do if they chose and in a very short time rainford left out of the door of his lordship's abode the nobleman was fortunately at home and tom rain delivered the letter to the servant who answered his summons then having desired the coachman to wait as he might have a fare back to bow street rainford hurried away at his utmost speed retracing his steps to the police office in the meantime the clerk had taken down the depositions of mr edward gordon and bingham while the most extraordinary sensation prevailed in the court the youth the loveliness the modest yet dignified appearance of esther de medina 
enlisted all sympathies in her favour and many a rude heart then present felt a pang at the idea of believing her to be guilty she had stood up when the prosecutor was called against her but when he reached that point in his evidence which mentioned the loss of his diamonds she clasped her hands convulsively together and trembling with agitation sank into the chair from which she had risen when the depositions were taken down the magistrate said prisoner you have heard the very serious charge against you have you anything to say in your defence and then she spoke for the first time since she had entered the court and though her words were delivered with impassioned emphasis the melodious tones of her voice sounded like a silver bell upon the ears of all present sir i am innocent i am innocent she exclaimed oh god knows that i am innocent the glance she darted from beneath her darkly fringed lids spoke even more eloquently than her words and every feature of her fine countenance seemed to bear testimony to the truth of her declaration would you not do well to send for your friends asked the magistrate in a kind tone these words seemed to touch her most acutely they summed up as it were all the painful features of her most distressing position oh my father my dear dear father she exclaimed her countenance expressing so much bitter bitter anguish that there was scarcely an unmoistened eye in the court your worship i do not wish to prosecute the case i am sorry i have gone so far said the diamond merchant wiping away the tears from his cheek for he was really a good-natured man it is not in my power to stay the proceedings replied sir walter ferguson the evidence is unfortunately strong against the prisoner she would do well to send for her friends let the case stand over for half an hour esther was accordingly conducted into the magistrate's private room where she was visited by the female searcher who endeavoured to persuade her with as much gentleness as she could command to mention the residence of her parents alas my mother has long been dead was the mournful reply and my poor father oh it would break his heart were he to know she checked herself and fell into a profound reverie despair expressed in her countenance during the remainder of the half hour which intervened ere she was led back to the office she replied only in vague and unsatisfactory but not self-inculpating monosyllables to the questions addressed to her at length the female searcher gave her an indirect intimation that her punishment on trial would be more lenient if she admitted her guilt and expressed her contrition what she exclaimed with a recovering sob do you really deem me culpable of this most heinous charge my god have the christians no mercy no compassion oh i shouldn't speak thus to you but i know that our race is looked upon with suspicion we are prejudged because we are jews and yet she added in a different and prouder tone there are as noble sentiments as generous feelings as estimable qualities among the members of the scattered tribe as in the hearts of those christians who have persecuted our nation for centuries and centuries the woman to whom these words were addressed was astonished at the enthusiastic manner in which the beautiful jewess spoke for there was something at that moment sublimely interesting eloquently commanding about esther de medina as the rich colour glowed more deeply upon the, her cheeks the blue veins dilated on her proud forehead and the whole power of her soul seemed thrown into her magnificent eyes it was at this moment that the usher of the court entered to conduct the jewess back to the office once more she stood in the presence of the magistrate now no longer subdued and crushed with terror but nerved as he were by conscious innocence to meet the accusation brought against her tom rain had returned to the court and by mingling with the crowd of spectators anxiously watched the countenance of esther de medina prisoner said the magistrate have you anything now to offer in your defence or have you sent to communicate with your friends relative to the position in which you are now placed sir answered esther her soft and musical tones falling like a delicious harmony upon the ears i have but one word to utter in my defence 
and if i did not speak it when i first stood before you it was simply because this terrible accusation bursting so abruptly upon the head of an innocent person stupefied me deprived me of the power of collecting my ideas neither was it until within a moment of my return into the court that the fact which i am about to state flashed to my memory sir i was not in london from two o'clock on the afternoon until half past ten at night on the thirty first of october a gentle a very gentle smile played upon her vermilion lips as she uttered these words and it was during the interval which you name that the prosecutor was visited by the female whom he believed to have robbed him of his diamonds observed the magistrate i deny having visited the prosecutor at all answered esther in a firm but respectful tone i never sold him a ring i never sold an article of jewellery to a living being placed by the honest industry of my father above want she continued proudly i labour not under the necessity of parting with my jewellery to obtain money at this moment a fine tall handsome young man of about six-and-twenty years of age entered the court he was dressed in an elegant but unassuming manner his bearing was lofty without being proud and his fine blue eyes indicated a frank and generous disposition slightly inclining in acknowledgment of the respect with which the crowd made way for him to pass he advanced towards the magistrate who instantly recognized him as an acquaintance at the same moment esther started with surprise and murmured the name of lord ellingham to the astonishment of all present tom rain perhaps excepted the nobleman shook esther kindly by the hand saying in the name of heaven mr medina what unfortunate or rather ridiculous mistake has brought you hither sir walter ferguson immediately directed the clerk to read over the depositions what exclaimed lord ellingham who had scarcely been able to restrain his indignation during the recital of the previous proceedings the daughter of a respectable and wealthy gentleman to be placed in such a position as this but in a moment i will make her innocence apparent at the very time when this robbery was alleged to have taken place at the hour when the female for whom this young lady has evidently been mistaken called upon the prosecutor mr medina was not within six miles of arundel street these words produced in the court a sensation which was the more lively because they seemed to corroborate the prisoner's own defence a defence which lord anningham had not heard mr gordon the prosecutor looked astounded and yet not altogether grieved at the prospect of the prisoner's discharge mr medina continued lord anningham has only recently arrived in london having retired from an extensive commercial business which he long carried on at liverpool he has become my tenant for a house and small estate situated at a distance of about seven miles from the metropolis and on the thirty first of october i accompanied him and his daughter the lady now present on a visit to the property thus leased we left london in my own carriage at about two o'clock on the day named and it was between ten and eleven at night when we returned during that interval of several hours mr medina never quitted her father and myself a murmur of satisfaction arose on the part of the spectators but it was almost immediately interrupted by the entrance of an elderly and venerable looking man whose countenance of that cast which ever characterizes the sons of the scattered tribe had once been strikingly handsome though not deficient in an expression of generosity it nevertheless exhibited great firmness of disposition and his keen black eyes denoted a resolute unbending and determined soul he was upwards of fifty-five years of age and was plainly though neatly dressed advancing into the body of the court he cast a rapid glance around <gasps> my father exclaimed esther and springing forward she threw herself into her parent's arm he held her tenderly for a few moments then gently disengaging himself from her embrace he murmured in her ear oh esther esther i can understand it all you have brought this upon yourself 
but these words were heard only by lord ellingham who advanced to shake hands with the jew that reproach appeared for the moment to be singular and altogether misplaced as it was impossible that esther could have perpetrated the crime imputed to her but the nobleman had not leisure to reflect upon it for mr de medina now perceived him and accepted the outstretched hand i was accidentally passing by the court said the jew and hearing my own name mentioned by some loungers outside paused to listen their conversation induced me to make inquiries and i learnt all the particulars of this charge and some unknown friend of mr de medina sent me a hasty note conveying the unpleasant intelligence answered lord ellingham but i believe that i have fully convinced his worship of your daughter's innocence these last words were uttered in a louder tone than the former part of the observation and were evidently addressed to the magistrate for my part said mr gordon i am perfectly satisfied that there is a grievous misunderstanding in this matter miss de medina is evidently unconnected with it and yet he added as his eyes dwelt upon her countenance never was resemblance so striking however i am well pleased to think that mr medina is not the person by whom i was plundered and i am most sincerely implore her pardon for the inconvenience nay the ignominy to which she has been subjected esther turned an appealing glance towards her father as if to remind him of some duty which he ought to perform or to convey some silent prayer which he could well understand but he affected not to notice that rapid but profoundly significant glance the magistrate then declared that the young lady was discharged without the slightest stain upon her character hastily drawing down her thick black veil esther de medina bowed deferentially to the bench and passed out of the office leaning on her father's arm and accompanied by the earl of ellingham tom rain followed her with his eyes until the door closed behind her for a few moments he remained wrapped up in a deep reverie then heaving a profound sigh he also took his departure end of section four Recording by Gray Clayton. Section 5 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds, Section 5. Chapter 5. The Appeal of Love. It was about eight o'clock in the evening on the day of which so many strange incidents occurred at Bow Street, that Lady Hatfield was reclining in a melancholy mood upon the sofa in the drawing-room of her splendid mansion she was dressed in black satin which set off the beauty of her complexion to the greatest advantage one of her fair hands drooped over the back of the sofa the other listlessly held a book to the perusal of which she had vainly endeavoured to settle herself there was a mysterious air of mournfulness about her that contrasted strangely with the elegance of the apartment the cheerful blaze of the fire the brilliant lustre of the lamps and the general appearance of wealth and luxury by which she was surrounded that sorrowful expression too was the more unaccountable inasmuch as the social position of georgiana hatfield seemed to be enviable in the extreme beautiful in person possessing rank and wealth and free to follow her own inclinations she might have shone the star of fashion the centre of that human galaxy whose sphere is the west end of london oh bright gloriously bright are the planets which move in that heaven of their own and yet how useless is their brilliancy the planets of god's own sky are made to bestow their light upon the orbs which without them would revolve in darkness but the planets of the sphere of aristocracy and fashion throw not a single ray 
upon the millions of inferior stars which are compelled to circle around them. To Lady Hatfield the pleasures and dissipation of the West End were unwelcome, and she seldom entered into society save when a refusal would prove an offence. Up to the age of seventeen or eighteen she had been remarkable for a happy, joyous, and gay disposition, but a sudden change came over her at that period of her life, and since then her habits had grown retired, her disposition mournful. But let us return to her as she lay reclining on the sofa in the drawing-room. The robbery of the preceding night and the events of the morning had evidently produced a powerful impression upon her mind. At times an expression of acute anguish distorted her fair countenance for a moment, and once or twice she compressed her lips forcibly, as if to restrain a burst of mental agony. The timepiece upon the mantel had just proclaimed the hour of eight when a domestic entered the room and announced the Earl of Ellingham. Georgiana started up, assumed a placid expression of countenance, and advanced to receive the young nobleman, who, as he took her hand, respectfully pressed it to his lips. Your ladyship will, I hope, pardon me for intruding at this hour he said as he conducted her back to the sofa and then took a chair at a short distance but i was not aware of your return to town until an hour ago when i perused in the evening paper an account of the outrage of last night and the investigation at bow street this morning how annoying it must have been to you my dear lady hatfield to have gone through the ordeal of a visit to a police court there is something gloomy and dispiriting in the aspect of these tribunals which the crimes of the human race have rendered necessary observed georgiana the countenances of those persons whom i beheld at the police office this morning had all a certain sinister expression which i cannot define but which seemed to proclaim that they never contemplated aught save the dark side of society the same idea struck me this day said lord ellingham for i also paid a visit to bow street and scarcely an hour i should conceive after you must have left the office but enough of this subject the words bow street police and tribunal grate painfully upon the ear even of the innocent that is if they possess hearts capable of sorrowing for the woes and crimes of their fellow creatures lady hatfield continued the earl drawing his chair a little closer it was to converse upon another topic yes another and more tender topic that i have hastened to your presence this evening georgiana was about to reply but the words died upon her quivering lips and an oppressive feeling kept her silent yes my dear lady hatfield continued the earl drawing his chair still more nigh i can no longer exist in this state of suspense during the whole of last winter i was often in your society and you were kind enough to permit my visits, and it was impossible to be much with you and not learn to love you. You departed suddenly for the country last July, but I dared not follow, for you had not even informed me of your intended retirement from London at so early a period. Pardon me if I say I felt hurt, yes, hurt, Lady Hatfield, because I loved you, and yet never, during that interval of four months, has your image been absent from my mind, and now I am again attracted towards you by a spell stronger than my powers of resistance. Oh, you must long ago have read my heart, Georgiana. Say then, can you, do you love me in return? There was something so sincere, so earnest, and yet so manly, in the fluent language of the Earl of Ellingham, his fine countenance was lighted up with so animated an expression of hope and love and his eyes bore such complete testimony to the candour of his speech that georgiana must have been ungenerous indeed had she heard that appeal with coldness nor was it so and the earl read in the depths of her melting blue orbs a sentiment reciprocal with his own my lord arthur she murmured you ask me if i can love you if i do love you and oh you know not the pang which that question excites in my heart yes she added hastily seeing that the earl was astonished at her words i do love you arthur for you are all that is good generous and handsome but my god how can i force my lips to utter the sad avowal 
speak georgiana speak i conjure you exclaimed lord ellingham you alarm me oh keep me not in suspense you say that you love me i never loved until i knew you i shall never love another answered georgiana fixing her deep silently expressive and intellectual eyes upon the countenance of the earl a thousand thanks for that declaration my heart's sole joy he cried in an impassioned tone and falling on his knees by the side of the sofa he threw his arms around her he clasped her to his breast his lips pressed hers for the first time but that joy lasted only for a moment with rebounding heart and with almost a scream of anguish georgiana drew herself back and abruptly repulsed her ardent lover and then covering her face with her hands she burst into a flood of tears my god what signifies this strange conduct ejaculated the earl as with wounded pride he retreated a few paces from the weeping lady forgive me forgive me arthur she wildly cried turning her streaming eyes towards him in a beseeching manner i am unhappy very unhappy and you should pity me pity you exclaimed the earl again approaching the sofa and taking her hand which she did not attempt to withdraw how can you be an object of pity beautiful beloved by one whose life shall be devoted to ensure this felicity of yours oh your generous affection arthur gives me more pain than all the rest cried georgiana in a rapid half hysterical tone as a weak woman i have dared to love you as an imprudent one i have confessed that love but now she added in a slower and firmer tone while her vermilion lips quivered with a bitter smile now as a strong woman as a woman restored to a sense of duty do i make the avowal and my heart is ready to break as i thus speak good heavens relieve me from this cruel this agonizing suspense passionately exclaimed the earl i will i will returned lady hatfield arthur dearly fondly devotedly as i love you proud as i should be to call you my husband happy happy as i should feel to link my fate with yours alas it cannot be never never she added with a frantic vehemence that caused every chord to thrill in the heart of her admirer georgiana is this possible he asked in a faint tone while a deadly pallor overspread his countenance would that it were not she murmured clasping her hands together in a visible anguish of soul and yet it is incomprehensible cried the earl starting back and even manifesting somewhat of impatience you are not a foolish girl who takes delight in trifling with a sincere attachment to an honest man who adores her you are not a heartless coquette looking upon her admirer as a slave whom she is justified to torture no no you yourself possess a generous soul you have no sympathy with the frivolous portion of your sex you are as strong-minded as sincere as you are beautiful tell me then georgiana what signifies this strange contradiction you love me you would be happy and proud to become mine and yet my god and yet you the next moment annihilate every hope in my breast alas how unpardonable must my conduct seem how inexplicable my behaviour exclaimed lady hatfield in a tone of despair i am not indeed a heartless coquette nor a weak frivolous girl in the sincerity of my heart do i speak arthur and if you be generous you will forgive me but i can never be thine then you love another cried the earl impatiently have i not solemnly assured you that i never loved till i knew you and shall never never love again she asked with a convulsive sob as if her heart were breaking but perhaps you were betrothed to another in your youth peradventure that other has some sacred pledge some irrevocable bond no no i am my own mistress none can control me interrupted georgiana her nervous state of excitement growing each moment more painful and your uncle your friends your advisers said the earl is it possible that they have become acquainted with my attachment towards you and that they have some motive to counsel you against my suit on the contrary but 
my god do not question me thus almost shrieked the unhappy lady i shall go mad i shall go mad oh there's some dreadful mystery in all this cried the earl and i too shall go mad if it be not explained merciful heavens a terrible suspicion flashes across my mind and yet no no it cannot be for you declare that you never loved another still still what motive save that can render you thus resolute not to become mine georgiana he said sinking his voice to a low tone and speaking with a solemn seriousness which had something even awful in its effect georgiana i conjure you to answer me me who am your devoted lover and your sincerest friend as you would reply to your god say if in your giddy and inexperienced girlhood ignorant through extreme innocence of the snare spread for you and in a moment of weakness you just heavens that you should suppose me criminal guilty shrieked georgiana covering her face with her hands pardon pardon cried the earl again falling on his knees at the feet of her whom he adored and forcibly possessing himself of one of her hands he conveyed it to his lips pardon me for the outrageous idea that i dare to express forgive the insulting suspicion which for a moment occupied my mind alas alas that i should have provoked that look of indignation which you ere now cast upon me when i withdrew your hand from before your eyes but ah now you smile and i am forgiven georgiana did smile but in a manner so plaintively melancholy that although it implied forgiveness for the injurious suspicion it still conveyed no hope there was a long and mournful pause the earl of enningham burned to penetrate the deep mystery in which the conduct of lady hatfield was shrouded and yet he knew not what other hypothesis to suggest he had no rival in her affections her friends offered no objection to his suit she was under no pledge to dispose her hand upon any particular individual and the evanescent suspicion that she might have once been frail and was too honourable to bring a polluted person to the marriage bed had been banished beyond the possibility of return what then could influence her conduct he knew not how to elicit the truth and yet his happiness was too deeply interested to permit him to depart in uncertainty and suspense georgiana he said at length and speaking in a tone which showed how profoundly his feelings were excitedly i appeal to your sense of justice whether you have acted candidly and generously in respect to me throughout the whole of last winter you permitted my visits i will not say encourage them because you have too much delicacy to have done that but you were never denied to me and you gave me not to understand that my calls were unwelcome when they began to exceed the usual limits of mere friendly visits at length my attentions became marked towards you and you must have read my feelings in my manner and my language my attentions alas why did you permit me to encourage the blossoming of hopes which are now so cruelly blighted by the unaccountable decision that you have uttered to-day oh do not reproach me arthur exclaimed georgiana and yet i know that i have acted imprudently but it was so sweet to be loved by you that i had not courage to destroy the charming vision at length i took a decided step or at least what seemed to me to be so i departed suddenly to my uncle's country seat without previously intimating my resolution to you and remember no avowal of affection on your part had then met my ears and it was impossible that i could have acquainted you with my proposed departure even if i had wished to do so because i did not see you on the day when i determined to quit london and had i written to you then would you not have thought that my note conveyed a hint for you to follow me fool idiot that i was not to have declared my passion months and months ago ejaculated the earl but say georgiana had i solicited your hand last summer ere you left london would those reasons which influence you now yes they were in existence then was the hasty reply and am i to remain in ignorance of the motives which compel you to refuse my suit asked lord ellingham bitterly is there no chance of their influence ceasing oh give me but a glimpse of hope 
and so powerful is my attachment so devoted my love merciful heavens exclaimed georgiana wildly am i then to lose such a man as this and again she clasped her hands convulsively together oh you love me you do love me my angel cried the earl and yet you refuse me what stern fate what terrible destiny can possibly separate us this mystery is appalling and a mystery it must remain said georgiana suddenly assuming that quiet and passive manner which indicated despair then farewell lady hatfield exclaimed the earl and be not surprised if i must attribute the disappointment the anguish the deep humiliation which i now experience to some inexplicable caprice of the female mind but madam he added drawing himself up haughtily and speaking in a tone of offended pride the earl of ellingham whose wealth and rank may enable him to vie with the mightiest peers of england will not be made the sport of the whims and wavering fancies of even the beautiful lady hatfield thus speaking the nobleman bowed coldly and advanced towards the door oh this is cruel this is cruel cried georgiana throwing herself hysterically back upon the sofa no madam it is you who are cruel to reject the honourable suit of one like me without deigning to vouchsafe an explanation said the earl persisting in his severity of tone and manner against the promptings of his generous nature but with the hope of eliciting a satisfactory reply then go my lord depart leave me cried georgiana for i never can be yours the earl lingered for a moment convulsive sobs broke from the lips of the unhappy lady hatfield but not a word to invite him to remain his pride would not permit him to offer farther entreaty and suffering cruelly at heart he rushed from the room in less than a minute georgiana heard the street door close and then burying her face in the cushion of the sofa she gave way unrestrainedly to all the violence of her grief End of section five recording by Gray Clayton Section six of the Mysteries of London Volume three This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org Recording by Gray Clayton the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section six chapter six dr lassells the interview between lady hatfield and the earl of ellingham was as long as it was painful and ten o'clock struck by the thousand churches of london as the nobleman quitted the mansion there was such a fierce struggle in his breast between wounded pride and fervent affection that his sorrow for the blighted hope of the latter was rendered less acute by being united with the indignation inspired by the former in spite of his generous nature he couldn't help thinking that he had been trifled with to some extent for it naturally seemed preposterous that georgiana should refuse him without a candid explanation of the motives and when every earthly circumstance appeared favourable to their union then again he pondered upon the wildness of her grief the delirious anguish which she had shown at several stages of their interview her solemn avowal of love for him alone and her voluntary assurance that she should be happy and proud to call him her husband he moreover reflected upon the steadiness of her character her aversion to the frivolities of the fashionable world her apparent candour of disposition and her total want of anything approaching to coquetry and he endeavoured to persuade himself that he had acted harshly by leaving her in anger yet what alternative had i he asked himself and would not any other man have in the same way cut short an interview of so mysterious and unsatisfactory so perplexing and humiliating a nature alas the earl of ellingham found himself the very next minute dwelling with an aching and compassionate heart upon the agonized state in which he had left the being whom he so tenderly loved 
he thought of her fascinating beauty her bewitching manners her well-cultivated mind her amiable disposition and then he said within himself oh if i have indeed lost her i have lost an angel he had reached the immediate vicinity of hatchett's hotel when he turned back with the resolution of seeking another interview with georgiana but scarcely had he retraced ten steps of the way ere he stopped short and asked himself what advantage could be gained by such a proceeding the decision is given he reasoned she can never never be mine wherefore should i renew her grief and my humiliation evoke fresh tears from her eyes and add sharpness to the sting of my disappointment no it may not be some terrible mystery shrouds her conduct from my penetration but shall i who am defeated in love give way to a base sentiment of curiosity it would be unmanly ignoble cowardly to attempt to extort her secret from her for a profound secret she doubtlessly cherishes a secret which has this evening influenced her conduct and perhaps he thought following the natural channel of his meditations that secret is of a nature which a modest woman could not reveal to one of the opposite sex the idea suddenly flashing across his brain suggested a proceeding which after a few moments of profound reflection he determined to adopt passing rapidly up dover street lord ellingham entered grafton street where he knocked at a door on which was a brass plate engraved with the name of dr lassells the physician was at home and the nobleman was immediately ushered into a parlour where he was shortly joined by the individual whom he sought dr lassells was a short thin sallow-faced man of about fifty he had small restless sparkling eyes a prim mouth and an intelligent though by no means prepossessing countenance he was devoted to the art which he practised and was reputed the most scientific man of the whole faculty his anatomical researches had been prosecuted with an energy and a perseverance which afforded occupation to half the resurrection men in london and more than once to the doctor's own personal danger in respect to the law it was whispered in well-informed circles that he never hesitated to encounter any peril in order to possess himself of the corpse of a person who died of an unusual malady his devotion to anatomy had materially blunted his feelings and deadened the kinder sympathies of his nature but his immense talents added to a reputation acquired by several wonderful cures rendered him the most fashionable physician of the day such was the medical gentleman whom lord ellingham called to consult excuse this late visit doctor said the earl but i knew that i might take the liberty of intruding upon you the words early and late are not in my vocabulary so far as they regard myself was the reply my hours are at the disposal of my patrons among whom i have the honour to include your lordship then without farther apology i shall proceed to state the object of my visit said the nobleman give me your hand you look dejected you are very pale your pulse it's not concerning myself altogether that i have to speak interrupted the earl withdrawing the hand which the doctor had seized i wish to consult you upon a subject intimately affecting my happiness the physician looked surprised and drew his chair closer to that in which the earl was seated to tell you the truth continued arthur i am deeply enamoured of a lady whose social position beauty fortune and intellect render her in every way worthy to become my wife well why don't you propose to her demanded the physician dryly i have and am rejected was the answer accompanied by a profound sigh the devil said the physician but what can i do for you in the matter surely your lordship does not believe in filters and love draughts ridiculous cried the earl impatiently if you'll grant me a few moments i will explain myself dr lassells folded his arms threw himself back in the chair and prepared to listen to his young friend's narrative the lady to whom i am attached continued the earl is as i ere now informed you in every way worthy of an alliance with me and she is moreover deeply attached to me 
she has never loved another and declares that she never can no apparent circumstances interfere with our union and she's done me the honour to assure me that she should be alike proud and happy to own me as her husband she is entirely her own mistress and even if she were not her friends would present no barrier to our marriage yet she refuses me and for some mysterious cause which she will not explain i just left her left her in a state of anguish such as i never before witnessed such as i hope never to behold again perhaps she's been guilty of some weakness which she's afraid you would discover suggested dr lascelles oh no no exclaimed arthur enthusiastically in an unguarded moment carried away by a hasty suspicion of the kind i hinted at that possibility and i soon repented of my rashness the lady's countenance flushed with a glow of honest indignation and instantly veiling her blushes with her hand she burst into tears i could pledge my existence doctor that she is purity itself but wherefore do you consult me in the matter asked lascelles you must admit doctor answered ellingham that my position is a singular one in reference to the lady to whom i speak what am i to conjecture suspense is terrible and yet not for worlds would i again attempt to extort her secret from her the motive may be a physical one said the doctor that was the idea which ere now struck me and which has brought me hither to consult you exclaimed the earl she may be the prey to some insidious disease which impairs not her exterior aspect at the present continued dr lascelles say for instance a cancer in the breast or again her motive may be a moral one insomuch as she may be aware from some secret warnings that she is in danger of suffering an aberration of reason and if the lady were a patient of your own doctor asked the earl should you be enabled to judge whether she were menaced by that dreadful mental malady to which you have alluded decidedly so replied the physician the earl rose from his seat and walked two or three times up and down the apartment dr lascelles followed him with his eyes as he surveyed the strong well-knit but slender and graceful form of the young nobleman the votary of science could not help thinking what a splendid skeleton he would make at length the earl stopped abruptly opposite the doctor and said in an impressive tone you will never reveal the particulars of this interview it's scarcely probable returned lascelles with a smile but you promise me you pledge your word never to breathe a syllable which may betray the motive of my present visit or the topic of our conversation persisted the earl never exclaimed the physician then listen said the earl sinking his voice almost to a whisper the lady of whom i have spoken is lady hatfield observed lascelles what you've guessed simply because every one said last winter that you were dying for her interrupted the doctor coolly and therefore i presume you have availed yourself of her ladyship's return to town to place your coronet at her feet yes i do allude to georgiana whose professional attendant you are cried the earl and believe me when i solemnly declare that no sentiment of impertinent curiosity never mind the motive said the doctor let's keep to the facts i have known lady hatfield for upward of five years and i can positively assure your lordship that there is not the slightest cause physical or moral with which i am acquainted that can influence her conduct towards you then what can this mystery be exclaimed arthur more perplexed than ever my god must i again fall back on the hypothesis of a woman's idle caprice the theory of her unaccountable whims is she the victim of an idiosyncrasy which she cannot control and must i be made its sport throughout the sphere of my extensive practice observed dr lascelles i know not a woman less likely to be swayed by idle caprice or unaccountable whims than lady hatfield her mind is strong her intellect bright and uncharacterized by the slightest eccentricity i have however frequently observed that her ladyship is the prey to a secret melancholy that she has her dark moments as one may denominate them but at those times the vigour of her soul is not subdued to a degree that would produce so strange a result 
as a decision affecting her own happiness. "'You say she loves you. "'I have not a doubt of the sincerity of her attachment,' cried the Earl emphatically. "'And yet she will not marry you,' said the doctor. "'I cannot comprehend it. "'Nor I,' observed Arthur, with exceeding bitterness of tone. "'My happiness is at stake. "'What can I do?' Had she explained the motive of her refusal, and were that motive a strong one? Did it reveal some cause which would render our union infelicitous? I might have borne up against this cruel, cruel disappointment. My love for her would then have been converted, by admiration of her generous candour, into a permanent friendship, and we might henceforth have met as brother and sister. But how can I ever visit her again? How can I meet her? beautiful and amiable as she is i adore her and yet i dare not in future trust myself in her presence no i must crush this love in my heart stifle it subdue it altogether oh fool that i am to talk thus as if it were practicable to forget her as if it were possible to cease to worship her ere now as i walked through the streets I endeavoured to blunt the keenness of my affection by placing it in contact with the amount of wrong which I deemed myself to have experienced at her hands. But, unjustly perhaps as she has treated me, humiliated as I felt, and still feel myself to be, chagrined, disappointed, rejected without explanation, oh, and all these injuries are absorbed in the immensity of the love which I bear her and in a state of extraordinary excitement arthur paced the room with agitated steps the doctor sat musing upon his chair he had ever been too much devoted to scientific pursuits to afford leisure to the delights of love and though he was married he had entered the connubial state only through motives of self-interest well aware that ladies prefer a medical attendant whose propriety of conduct is or at least appears to be guaranteed by marriage he had one day cast his mental eyes around the circle of his acquaintance and his glances were at length fixed upon a wealthy widow who was one of his patients jumping into his cab he called upon her and in order not to waste time proposed while he felt her pulse she simpered an assent and as she could not name the day he did it for her while he wrote out a prescription then he pocketed her guinea all the same uh, not through meanness but from the regularity of professional habit and had she offered him a fee as an acknowledgment for his loss of time on the morning they were issued from the church he would also have taken it this union was sterile but the doctor found that he had obtained an excellent wife who kept his house in good order did the honours of his table to admiration and never interrupted him when he was engaged in his study we have only introduced this little episode in the life of dr lassells just to convince our readers that he was not at all the man to comprehend the vehemence of dr ellingham's love thus while the nobleman was pacing the apartment in the manner described above and declaiming in reference to his passion the physician was meditating profoundly upon the conduct of lady hatfield in refusing so excellent a match his mind habituated to connect everything as much as possible to the special sphere of science wherein he moved soon lost itself in a field of conjecture as to whether there might not be some physical cause carefully concealed even from himself which would elucidate the mystery the result of his meditations was not at all satisfactory to himself but he resolved that he would not allow the matter to remain just where it was this determination he did not however communicate to lord ellingham who took his leave more bewildered than ever as to the motive which could have possibly induced lady hatfield to assure him of her love and yet refuse him her hand end of section six recording by gray clayton